Hello, I'm from Channel YouTube 151. My name is Joe, and today we have another author interview. We have John Drake here. There. There. Um, Hello. We're going to talk about three of his books, and then we're going to talk about his other projects, how he got into writing, the contacts, and then we'll be done. So let's do it. John, tell me about your first book. First book, which is Making Man. Go! No pressure. First book, Making Man, available in all good websites called Amazon. Yeah, this is a story of, they're all comedies, so this first one I wrote in 2018, or finished it in 2018, this is uh, the story of a Neanderthal engineer uh, named Cobble, and he, basically he invents lots of things for his tribe, they don't, they don't appreciate anything that he's done, they don't like his modern thinking, um, and so he, the upshot of this is that he disappears and goes off on an adventure. Uh, with his sidekick uh, called Bones, uh, so named because he's tall and thin, and they go off on, in search for more like-minded people. So they go off looking through, they go through through mountains, all kinds of adventures across plains, and they go, end up in a forest um, called Nutty Woods, um, and they find what is ostensibly like the Cro-Magnon people, um, who all talk in, a, in a, a terribly, terribly posh English accent, and they're all called... Uh, you know, Campbell and and you know, silly names like that, um, and they're all terribly posh and they can't fend for themselves. So the numbers have been dying out. So they kind of embrace Cobble and his and his uh, engineering ways, and they find ways to hunt and and do all kinds of things like that. Um, and it, it's just a bit of a it's a it's a bit of an adventure story. I think what one review said there was a, an element of the Hobbit in it. Um, because it's just you know kind of two guys going off on an adventure and they, they, they just they just get up to funny stuff you know so they end up trapped in a badger set and um and they're trying to get out and they're standing on you know a badger that's fallen and ended up uh, dead beneath them and they're using that as a way to try and get up and out and just like silly stuff but it's um but it's great fun that the, the a lot of the names are um are plays on words and puns and things like that so cobble obviously makes things and so he cobbles things together um a lot of the the names because the because the the tribe that's there are, are are so kind of stagnant in in their thinking all of the well first of all that the the village is called boredom um <laughs> but it's it's, it's name but it's b-o-a-r so it's named after a boar that um somebody is supposed to have killed back in the day but actually the boar just fell down a fell down a hill and landed on a, a spike, but the guy took all the credit for it because they were so terrible at hunting and, and fending for themselves. So they all thought he was amazing. So they named the village after him. Um, so it was called Boredom. Um, but like the, the the forest that they live next to is is obviously green because it's a forest. So they call it um, Green Forest. And the mountain that all the caves are in, they call Cave Mountain and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's all just, <laughs> they're all just very, very stagnant in, in what they do. And um, and this guy kind of shakes things up and, and he goes off and there's I'm not sure how much of a spoiler to put into it but there's anyway there's a reason that there's a something that brings them all together again so the the people in in Nutty Woods the posh terribly posh old Etonian uh, type people and the old the old men in boredom uh, they they kind of end up meeting and. Um, I'll leave it at that actually because there's more spoilers if I do any more than that. But that's that's making man. So that was out in in July 2018. Um, I'll go through the reasons I wrote that in, uh, later on. I was going to um, say if you want, we could, we'll just talk a little bit about that now. Like, how, what what made you come up with that idea? Because quite a unique idea, really. Yeah, and and actually, that's really the answer to the question. So I, I was when I was kind of choosing what to make the my first book about. I thought, well, I, I'd in a kind of naive um, marketing idea way, I thought, well, I'll, I'll make something that isn't out there and, and something new and fresh for people to read. Um, it turns out I should have just written vampire romance or something because that's what everyone wants. But anyway, um, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll think of something new and different. And um, I, I don't, I hadn't remembered there ever being a, a, a caveman comedy. Mm. And there's one now because um, Arben Studios have since done one. But anyway, um, so I, I didn't remember a book certainly. And um, the, when I started it, all, all I all I knew when I started it was that it would be about cavemen. And then I thought, well, I'll, I'll make the premise a little bit quirky. So I'll, I'll make him something that the Neanderthals aren't famous for, which is, which is for their engineering. Now they may well have been very good at engineering. I don't really know, but they're not kind of famous for it. So I thought well, I'll make him an engineer, and that'll be a quirky juxtaposition. And 
and that was all I knew when it, when I started when I wrote the first line that was all I knew <clears throat> and I just started writing it and I I put the character on um, on a rocky outcrop for once <laughs> it's very difficult as well because when you're writing in kind of prehistoric times there aren't too many reference points to use as analogies and things it's quite tricky but anyway I um so I, I sat him on a rocky outcrop and I thought well, I better describe the scenery so I had the green forest and cave mountain and things like that um, and the great grey plain because it was quite big and it was grey. And um, and that then in turn gave me the idea for the rest of the tribe being so unimaginative, you know? So plain, that's plain a, folk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, uh, and that was, when I started writing it, that was li quite literally all I knew about the story. So I, I just started writing. So I started him writing about these inventions he was making and then I, thought, well, they're not going to really, you know, appreciate his inventions. So that set a bit of a dynamic between him and the tribe, which in turn led to him leaving. And even as I'm writing it and and, <clears throat> and he's leaving the tribe, I don't really know what's going to happen to him when he does leave or who he's leaving with or anything. And I just kind of laid the tracks of the plot as I went along and it just kind of morphed into into what it is now. So um, it, 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 it was just... Yeah, it was great fun to write. And it's kind of, it, it's just kind of a a nice gentle story with a bit of wordplay in there. Um, one of the reviews said it was storytelling they were missing. It's kind of just old an old fashioned story, a bit like The Hobbit. You know, it's just, it's just um, with, with fewer dragons, but um, it's just kind of, it just kind of meanders along. And there's there's just fun in there with the wordplay and the, and the comedy that's in there um, and the wit. And, and it, it's just, a light-hearted kind of summer read, I would say, Jim, it's that kind of a feel to it, really. No, it sounds very good. Sounds very interesting. Next book, let's do it. The second book. Okay. One jump drink. Have a drink first. Relax. No pressure. Quick. So the, uh, it's it's gin. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's not gin. Should probably say it's like half ten in the morning. It isn't gin. It's water. <laughs> okay. So the next one is cheating death. And again, the same kind of principle when I was thinking about making man and thought, well, cavemen comedies haven't really been done before. This is a, a comedy, or actually very much more of a satire, really. So this is a satire set during the Black Death of 14th century Europe, which is a fam famously jovial period in history. Um, and aside from, you know, a bit of Monty Python, <clears throat> it hasn't really been done before as a comedy. Um, and it became apparent to me halfway through writing why that's the case, because it's quite tricky to make it, make it funny when... People are popping their clogs left, right, and centre. But basically, this is a story of uh, <laughs> God, this is a story of a, um, a Sicilian con man who um, he, he plots to uh, take a, a huge amount of, of money from the Doge of Genoa. So the Doge was like the you know, kind of a city-state ruler. Um, so he has this grand plan. To, to extort money from him. But when he gets there, uh, he gets to Genoa and he, he kind of talks his way into the, the Doge's private quarters, into his office. And the Doge is, again, without giving too much away, but the Doge is kind of one step ahead of him. And the, the con man, Niccolo, he, he makes up a story of a plague rising in the south. And that was his way to, to get in, to, to warn him, so to speak. Um, and he pretends to be from a, a big noble family that the Doge has never heard of because it doesn't exist. And unbeknownst to Niccolo, the, the plague does exist. And so the Doge knows this and he sends him off to Avignon to search for a mysterious guy called the Cutler. And that's all. He, and he has to send him, deliver a message to him um, to kind of to, to. So that the Doge doesn't bump him off, basically, is, is the gist of it. So. There's a few strands to this one. So, so Niccolo is, is heading to Avignon from uh, from Genoa. Then there's uh, a a German woman called Hildegund who travels from Germany to uh, on a mission to assassinate the Pope because her her brother had joined the Flagellant Movement, who are the guys in the Monty Python things where they're whipping the backs constantly, you know. So. Her brother had done that and then uh, was a little bit too overzealous and threw himself out of a pub window um, from three stories up. And Why? Um, why, why? Why would you do something? I know. 
<laughs> so um, to, to, to show that this, actually, yeah, it's probably worth mentioning, this probably isn't the book for like a devout Catholic or anything, because it's, <laughs> there's, a, there's, there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of tongue in cheek poking at, at that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, the flagstone, so we thought, well, I'll, I'm going to, you know, this this will really show God. I'm going to jump out of a big building anyway. So his sister feels very bitter about this and decides to blame uh, the, the church for the for the death of her brother. So she marches to Avignon to kill the Pope. So that's her. That's her. As you do. Pop. As you do. Yeah. Then there's a, a a guy named Cuthbert who is living in the south of England um, near Canterbury, and he doesn't kill the parish priest, but everyone thinks he has killed the parish priest, but actually the parish priest is performing an exorcism in his bedroom and falls through the floor because he's jumping around so much, getting so excitable about it. And he lands he lands on a on a hook down in the kitchen and anyway, pops his clogs. And, uh, and so he is sent on a pilgrimage to Avignon to repent for this sin that he didn't commit. But he meets up with a guy called Robert, who is a serial pilgrim and he, he, when he's back at home, he's sick of his wife and kids. So he keeps doing things to annoy the parish priest that gets him sent to Avignon to do pilgrimages. So he gets a few months away from his kids and his, and his wife. So he, uh, so those two meet up, and Robert is a bit, um, a bit of a delinquent and knows all the good pubs to go to on the way down to Avignon and all this kind of stuff. And so Cuthbert evolves from, you know, a, a timid kind of devout, uh, kind of, you know, eighteen-year-old into this debauched drinker when by the time they get to Avignon. So they have a little story about how they get to that. And then the, the Pope is a character um, and is an old friend of his arrives to Avignon and his old friend is a bit like a he's a bit like a student and he's only in the priesthood for the tax breaks and the good wine and that kind of stuff. So um, there's, there's a bit of comedy around there. And so yes they all they all kind of converge um, on the, the Palais de Pape in Avignon, and I probably can't say any more than that because it'll definitely be a spoiler. But anyway, the, the, those those kind of plot lines all into 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 wind and uh, end up in in Avignon to a great. That good. So that's cheating death. How did so you, that one. How did you come about that idea then? If you can, what, what sort of um, sparked all that? There's quite a bit going in there. Yeah, there is, and and the. I suppose that the general setting of the Black Death was just because it was such a juxtaposition to put comedy into the Black Death. Um, it's also just, I mean, the, like a lot of us, I suppose, I just have a, a passing interest, general interest in the Black Death because it's such a, such a fascinating time in, in history that so many people, especially these days, you know. Um, yeah. So so much for reading being escapism. Anyway, if you read Cheating Death this year, it won't feel like escapism. But anyway, um, and, and so I, I just thought, well, I... I it'd be good to do a comedy around the black death and to do that, you're going to need a few different strands for it to, to really work because if you, you know, at some point people are going to have to die because it's the black death and however many millions of people died. So if you, if you, if you do one of those stories where there's, you know, two main characters and that's it, then it, it wouldn't necessarily be believable that they're going to make it all the way to the end without, you know, without coming a cropper. So, yeah. So with all that, that, that's it. And there needs to be there needs to be a storyline that isn't just the Black Death as the story. So the assassination of the Pope, because there was such a because the Church was so revered in, in that period, and 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 it was so powerful because everyone thought that the it was God's wrath that was sending down this yes. plague on people. So to have people rallying against the Church instead of with the Church, I thought was another interesting juxtaposition. So that brought Hildegund into it, and then. The Cuthbert and Robert story was just a bit of a laugh, so I thought that'd be you know that's just, it was just a bit of light that, humor, that'd... just something going on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, going around getting drunk and um, doing things they shouldn't be doing. But of course, but sorry, one <laughs> thing that's worth mentioning is that they don't know anything about the plague because they're coming from the north, so they're just meandering down, happy as Larry, having a great old time, <laughs> and then suddenly get smacked in the face by this plague. So, um, so yeah, so that that was it. Really, it was just that was. That book took me the, the the least amount of time to write, and in in my opinion, anyway, is, is of the three that I've finished so far, that's the that's the best written book and the most kind of complete story and and, and complicated story that works, you know. Um, 
And there's less, in that one, there's less kind of frivolous wit, not frivolous wit, but just like the, you know, the, the names aren't necessarily, you know, comedic names like Cobble and, and that kind of thing, like, like yeah. in Making Man. Um, it's more the scenarios are, are unusual, you know, so people who are supposed to be on a pilgrimage getting drunk instead, that, it, that's the that's the humour as much as anything, you know, so so a different kind of book, but um, yeah, it, it was, it, it, I think it was 10 weeks from start to finish, which is, I don't think I'll ever write a, a whole book in 10 weeks again in my life, but um, but that was that was that one. So that's Cheating Death. That was out in 2019, last year. Cool. The photo, actually, on the front is, my brother took the photo, and it's a, it's a church in Wilmslow, in case anyone's interested. So, uh, And that's the Palais de Pape, which is the building that was around during the, the Black Death, and it's still around today. So there you go. Little fun fact for you there. No, that's good. More than merry, yeah. I don't mind. Let's yeah. talk about your third yeah. book then. Let's, let's get on to the, we're on to your last one. Let's go. Yeah, so this is Killing Chance. Um, this is the story of Genghis Khan. Um, another comedy, again, because, you know, Genghis Khan isn't really associated with comedy, particularly. <laughs> so I um, noticed you, you try and lighten up bad times. That's yeah, what you yeah, yeah. A lot of these, you know what I mean? Because being in the Neanderthal, it's probably not quite a good time. Lots of death and being eaten. You know, black death, <laughs> not really a nice time. Lots of death. And it, you're mm. trying to lighten it all, which is quite good, really, because, yeah. you know, yeah, I like it. <laughs> I, think, I, think that, I think I'll have to do one by 2020 then, won't I? I'll have to do some well, kind of comedy. Around. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. So, yeah, so, so Killing here, Chance. Hear this book then, do it. Yeah, so this is Killing Chance. It's uh, another satire um, about this time about Genghis Khan. And the the story, actually, first of all, the reason I picked Genghis Khan is um, it, it's as simple as that. I'm, I'm a fan of Con Eagledon, and he did the uh, the the Emperor series, the Emperor series for Julius Caesar, and the Conqueror series for Genghis Khan. And it's um, it's effectively just his life story done in, in a novel, really. So, um, so I've I've got a, again a, a passing interest in that as I did with the, the Black Death. So I thought, well, that's something I have an interest in, and is an untapped uh, resource for, for comedy, as a lot of things are, really. So, um, the uh, and again, uh, I looked for a juxtaposition that we could put in there in, in terms of the plot, and Genghis Khan is famous for, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but there's a percentage of everyone in Europe having um, been descended from Genghis Khan. I think it might be like 2.5% or something have, uh, have his DNA running through them. So... Um, so I decided that I would do it. So he had no children at all and no heir to his to the carnage. Oh. oh dear! And um, which is, which is utter nonsense because you know he, he could take his pick. But um, so that's what I did. And uh, so I had just a, a, a few characters called um, Stan and Jockey. And did, this was this was definitely more frivolous than Cheating Death. I'd obviously finished Cheating Death and thought I'm not. <laughs> Not doing something like that. Again. I need to. I need to lighten it up a bit more. So, um, so Jockey is someone who obviously the Mongols were famous for for being great, um, great horsemen um, yes. and archers. And Jockey is excellent on a horse, but a terrible aim. So he couldn't, you know, he couldn't shoot anything with his arrow. Um, and Jockey, J, it's J O C H I, which is important to note because it's obviously meant to read as a jockey, as in a horse and jockey, you know, mm. uh, and he's great with horses. But actually, Genghis Khan's actual son, or one of his actual sons, was called Jockey, J-O-C-H-I. So anyone who happens to pick it up and know something about Genghis Khan will, will, will see that. And there's a there's a, a kind of a mystery running through it where you don't know who the heir to the Khanate is. So you, you find out that there's one out there and, it, and the person doesn't know that they're the heir. Um, so there's a bit of trying to work out who it is and, and who it isn't. So um, and there's a few little kind of <clears throat> a few little red herrings for for people who know a bit about Genghis Khan, which which is fun to put in. So they um, so anyway, they, there's a band of, of three three guys, um, Jockey, Meki, and Stan, and they are sent to a Jin city, so an ancient Chinese city, really, um, to do a reconnaissance mission, so Genghis Khan can go and burn the living daylights out of the city and and take it for himself. So Genghis sends his human resources manager um, to go with them to uh, to this city, 
And again, I thought the, just the idea that Genghis Khan had a human resources manager was, I thought, was too too funny not to put in. So, um, so he's in there, and he's an old kind of learned man, and he's going with these three kind of misfits off to this ancient Chinese city. So they go in, and they have a bit of a caper around there, and they're trying to, you know, do a reconnaissance mission without looking like they're doing a reconnaissance mission. And then while they're away, Genghis discovers that he has an heir. So he uh, he finally has a chance to, you know, to secure his, his legacy, I suppose. So then he then goes after them with his the whole Mongol horde and tries to get into the, the Jin city to uh, to rescue him. But there's a, this, this one is definitely, definitely more kind of more lighthearted and more, um, you know, it's just a bit of crack, you know, and... and like Genghis Khan has claustrophobia, so when he ends up in the in the city and they're having a you know a, a, a secret meeting down in a dungeon, he's he's loving the fact that the dungeon has like a mace attached to the wall and a, and a rack there and all this kind of stuff, but he hates the fact that he's he's inside, so he gets yeah. all we're all flustered. So Genghis Khan is flustered, which is in and of itself is a is a quirky thing. So so there's a there's just a lot of um, there's a lot of silliness in there. That there's a a character who's like you know seven feet tall and built like a brick what's it and um but is just kind of a, a, a bit like the village idiot you know he's he's he's, a, he's he's like patrick from spongebob squarepants you know he's just yep. he's just not very bright you know so um so he goes around and and kind of misunderstands what thing people are saying and there's there's just a lot of comedy around um misinterpretations and, and things like that and you no, I can't say that actually. That's a spoiler, so I'll leave that one out. But anyway, that, it's just it's just a good bit of fun. And then there's um like the names in there are, are, are some of my favourite names that I've I've put. So there's like the the Jin Emperor. His um his aide is called Bao Lo, and and all this kind of stuff. And the the leader of the Jin city the Jin city is called Reason, R H uh, I Z U N, but obviously meant to sound like you know Reason as in within Reason. Yeah. Um. And uh, the leader of that city is called Ruling, do you know, and, and, and stuff like that. So it's just like there's just lots of silliness in there, and there's um, like the the captain of the watchtower always has pants on his head and he can't find them. And, you know, it's, it's just it's just as as unlike the actual Mongol horde and ancient Jin Empire as you could possibly get. But um, but again, that was that was great great fun to write that one, um, and not for anyone who wants a nice serious historical novel it's definitely, definitely i would never have guessed <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so they're the three they're the three main main novels that i've done um there's a couple of other little ones where i i see i also do um short stories mostly for competitions and things and um i always think that when you when you stuck to a very short word count limit it's very difficult to get comedy into it because part of the comedy is knowing the characters and, and not expecting them to say certain things or, yeah. or expecting them to say certain things. So um, so when I do the short stories, I tend to go the total opposite direction. It's like the Black Death one without without the comedy. Just so I tend to pick some... Yeah. Just, just Absolutely, pure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Really <laughs> miserable stuff. Yeah. So, um, so this one's like the Pareto Prize um, is done every year. So last year um, I did a story about a, a homeless man which made it into the anthology. Um, and I'll, show, I'll give a spoiler to this one anyway. So, so it, it, this one's a story of a homeless man from his point of view, and he's lying on a in a like an alcove on a street in in Dublin. And it's just a story of what it's only you know a couple of thousand words long, but it's a story of um, of what he's seeing. So he's seeing a crowd gathering around him, and he's seeing blue lights flashing, and he doesn't know what's going on. And anyway, the upshot is um, that from he was already dead from the start of the of the yeah. story but you don't you don't realize that until the end so that was a really cheerful one so um real real chirpy chirpy one for the beach that one completely um, polar opposite to what your other work it, is yeah yeah exactly yeah and then the the it, this year's one um i've just just found out this week that it's um my entry for this year's preta prize um made it into the anthology as well so oh, very good that came came forth um and that was another cheery one about uh, dementia so that was um that was uh, hilarious, but uh, oh. so that, that's what I've, that's, that's what I've done so far. Anyway, they're my that's my my bibliography thus far. That's good. That is very good. 
more than me, so don't worry about that. Smashing it, you and your gin. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, other projects. You said you're doing a sci-fi. I don't know if you said it on this or you said to me beforehand. What's what's yeah. going on with that? What can you say without ruining it? Yeah, well, I could probably say it all because I don't know how it's going to end yet myself. So, um, but I've... What a um, <laughs> yeah. My... Um, I suppose my, my it's probably worth mentioning my, my two biggest influences would be probably unsurprisingly would be Terry Pratchett and, and Douglas Adams. Um, just comedy, absolute comedy geniuses, genii. And um, so I, I thought that I, I've done, I've done a lot of, hist well, the, the, all three of the books are, are, have a historical setting. So I thought, well, I, I'll, I'll kind of try and unshackle myself and, and just go make everything up completely, you know, rather than having to, have certain parameters that you have to work inside. So, so I, I thought right, I'll, I'll I'll have to do a I'll have to do a sci-fi comedy and see if I can. Um, not certainly not fan fiction. It, I wouldn't I wouldn't want to write it if it, if it read like a fan fiction of Douglas Adams, but just something in that vein. So that kind of style, because I think since since he died, then there's been very little in the way of kind of his style of sci-fi comedy. I suppose like the British sci-fi comedy would be a way to put it. Um, so I thought I'll try and do something like that. So the work, the working title is a bit unfortunate, but it's, it's about, it's called Zoomers, which um, when it gets released, hopefully early next year, um, it, people will think it's about Zoom meetings in 2020 or yeah. you know, that's why, that's why I called it. But annoyingly, I, uh, I, I, entitled it before COVID came around. Um, but anyway, it's called Zoomers. And the idea is that the all life on the un, in the universe is ending. And um, there's a, a planet in a, an as yet unnamed nebula uh, called Arcadia. And they are, um, they've developed a the technology so they can both time travel and this certainly isn't the right phrase, but place travel. But anyway, they can go to any point in the universe at any point in time. So they're going to the to planets just before what they call the end day. So just before all life is extinguished on the planet, and try to to map some kind of pattern as to why life is why life is ending, um, and and then obviously try to then stop all life from ending in the universe. So that's the the general kind of thrust of the the story. But they um, they decide to choose somebody from Earth because they wouldn't be kind of polluted by the perspective that they have of all the technology and know what's going on. So they they pick somebody from a, a low tech planet who can just have a look at it with a fresh set of eyes, basically. Yeah. So they pick a guy called Scratch, who is a petty thief from South End, and uh, and he a gets, unique character uh, to pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have no idea why I picked South End actually. It's probably because Tram Tr my team Tramway were probably playing South End the weekend I, I did it probably, but um, so we um, so so he gets zoomed uh, as it is um, to Arcadia, and um, and he gets bounced around. Well, you know, it, it, basically portals open up and suck him in and, and spit him out somewhere else, and he has to go off and, and find out what's going on. But then there's a there's a bit of a um, well, it might be a malfunction. I haven't quite decided yet. But anyway, there's, there's something goes wrong when he initially gets zoomed to Arcadia, and he brings with him three other Earth people who uh, who weren't supposed to arrive there. So there's a guy from um, is he from Newbury? I think I made him from or Basingstoke or somewhere uh, called Mister Raysbeck, who's like a stuffy middle aged suburban middle class man, and um, <clears throat> and he's waiting. He also he gets zoomed to Arcadia as well by mistake. Um, and he's waiting on a sofa delivery. So he's supposed to be in the house between eight o'clock and one o'clock to, to accept a sofa delivery. So all he's doing is going around complaining that, um, you know, I'm supposed to be at home. Like he's, he doesn't, he, it doesn't quite register with him that he's on another planet. Do you know, like he's just, well, I have to, I have to get home to, uh, to get this sofa delivery. This is, this is a disgrace. Where's customer service? And he's, you know, with all this kind of stuff. So he goes around looking on this alien planet, looking for a customer service desk. And of which there isn't one, unsurprisingly. Um, and asking people, you know, are you from Shuffle Bottom and Sons? You know, I need to get a sofa delivered. And um, so anyway, he and Scratch, there's a big portentous red button in the middle of the room where they've all arrived on this alien planet. Oh, you've got to and press it. Sorry? You've got to press it. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So, which is what happens. So, um, Mr. Raisbeck decides that that's the bell for customer services to find out what's going on. It's just the bottom of So, as he goes to press it, um, Scratch, the character from South End, says, oh, don't do that. It's a, it's a big red button. What are you doing? You don't press big red buttons. So, uh, anyway, they press it at the same time. And so, the two of them then get sent on these zooms around the universe rather than just one of them, which is the original plan. So that sets off a you know a chain reaction of of silliness really. So um, they end up going to all kinds of different planets. They end up in Victorian South End um, on the day of the first ever Grand National, and uh, just just lots of silly stuff. And then you end up in futuristic South End. Anyone from South End should definitely read it. But um, <laughs> it's, it's they just get back. <laughs> Make sure you do your advertising on Facebook, so it locates yourself in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I mention, when, if, if ever I put a quote up on Twitter and it's got you know the word South End in, in part of the quote from the from the book, um, my South End retweets it every time. So I don't know what they think uh, is going on in South End at the moment, but anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah. But that's that's good fun. Like like when they when they arrive in Victorian South End and scratch the main character, who's kind of like a cheeky kind of petty thief guy you know um he he says oh it's uh it's it's victorian south end and, and this stuffy mr raisbeck says well, how, how do you know it's victorian south end and scratch is like well well there's mist ain't there there's always mist around victorian times and it's like just that kind of silliness you know and um and anyway they get into all kinds of trouble and um and at the moment they're in the process of uh saving the universe which you know, what better thing Good. to do on a Tuesday morning? So that's um, so that's Zuma. So that's going to be hopefully finished this calendar year, um, all being well, and that'll be out um, early next year. So that's my first dabble in, in sci-fi, but it's it's been both brilliant to do because you get such an a, such a blank slate to do whatever you want with it. You can you can just make stuff up. It's brilliant, but also. It's actually quite tricky because you have to make all the stuff up. Do you know? So normally, if I'm doing dialogue, I'll be rattling through it, and you know, and, and the, the words will be flowing out, and that's great. But then, as soon as I get to a descriptive point, I can't just you know imagine, I don't know, the outside of Liverpool Town Hall and go and just describe that as if it was this building I'm trying to describe. You have to just make it up completely because it, it has to be something from an alien planet, and it's so different. And you end up sitting there, kind of just staring at at the window for for long periods of time. So it's been tricky on that side of things, but um, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it can't just have four walls, you know, it's that kind of stuff. So um, it's been tricky, but it's been great fun to be able to just you know just do silly stuff, and it's okay because it's sci-fi, you know, and you can just make it all up. And I think sci-fi lends itself so well to comedy. For, for exactly that reason, that it, I'm surprised there aren't more people doing what Douglas Adams did. Um, obviously, maybe not to his standard, but you know, I'm surprised there aren't more more people like me doing what what I'm trying to do. But um, I think it's worth doing anyway because we all need a bit of a laugh. Then. Yes, well, I agree, and it sounds interesting too. What other uh, yeah. projects have you got? Have you got any other projects you're tinkering with? Because obviously, this is what you're doing now. Have you got anything else you kind of like the idea of or something? Um, well, so yes, yeah, sort of. Um, I, I I turned the the, uh, the first kind of few segments of Zoomers. I turned into a screenplay for a pilot episode of a, of a of a sitcom. Um, kind of, I suppose, Red Dwarf style. You know, would be that kind of a, an idea. So that's that's been turned into a, the first one into a screenplay. Um, so hopefully that's going to get out there and, and and see what we can be done with that. Um, we're looking to try and get Making Man um, done as an animation, perhaps, uh, which is the that's the the Neanderthal engineer one. Uh, although that has Armin Studios, uh, I've, I've done that since I wrote that, so maybe that isn't uh, the way <laughs> the way to go with that one. Um, I'm entering short stories. I'm, I'm trying to. I, I've done a good few of the, the the morbid, morose. Don't read these if you're feeling a bit down. Kind of stories. Um, so once I have a few more of those, then I can do my own kind of anthology, I suppose, with all, all my own miserable things in. But I think what I'll probably do with that is I'll I'll have I'll probably do it in f short stories, but obviously because that's what they are. But the um, in four parts. So there'll be a you know this is the miserable one and the section, and this is the the comedy section and this is the such and such section so that 
you could kind of pick it up and depending on what mood you're in, you could go and read the comedy ones or you could go and read the the ones about, you know, the old woman sitting at her husband's grave. You know, they're, they're, really, they're really kind of, you know, ones that won't cheer you up. So I'll hopefully have a collection of short stories uh, for that. Um, and then probably, depending on the success of Zoomers, and the, the, the feedback for Zoomers so far, the little bits that I've put up online, has been on, pardon the pun, but it's been on a different planet compared to the other three that I've done. So I'm hoping that, that Zoomers is going to be, you know, a, a big hit. I, I, I'm proud of what I've done of it so far, and it's it's the funniest I've been um, in a book so far. So, um, so hopefully that'll do well. Um, but if it doesn't, then, or even if it does, perhaps, I think I'm probably going to do an Easter Island um, comedy next um, because I think there's been one, maybe two novels set on Easter Island. Certainly not a comedy. There always a, I think it's a, one's a romance and one's a, a war one, I think, I'm not sure. But um, so I might do a comedy for Easter Island because that has a, a bit of scope and that's something I definitely have an interest in is Easter Island. I love the, the mystery of that place. So, um, so I think they're, they're probably the next ones. Um, but I suppose it all depends how, how Zoomers goes. I'm, I'm, I'm so kind of focused at the moment on trying to get Zoomers finished um, be, because it's, I'm getting impatient because, because I know it's good. So I, I just can't wait for it to get out there for, for people to read. Um, and, you know, it, it was, it got an honorable mention. I did a, a shorter version of it and sent it into a, the writers of the future competition in, uh, in America. And they got an honorable mention there. So it's, you know, it's, it's not tripe, do you know, <laughs> like it, the, there's some merit to it. So, and I'm really proud of what I've done of it so far. So I just want to make sure I, I get that right. Um, I want to make sure that it's, it's not just, you know, oh, it's a good book and I've, I've hit the word count, do you know, I, I, I want to make sure that it's a, it's, the last third of it is as brilliant as the first two thirds have been so far. So, um, so that's that's really where, where I'm focused at at the moment is just trying to, you know, get that done. Oh, sounds very good. It does it sounds very good? It sounds like you're very busy and you're always keeping yourself to it as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he's back on gin again. Look. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. how, did you, <laughs> how did you get into writing? Explain or tell the people who aren't actually watching yet, but I hope you will be. How yeah. you got into um, writing and what brought you into this lovely career? Okay, I'll, I'll start with a plug then because this one is um, this little book here, Pros and Cons, uh, the Corner Scribblers. They asked me to be um, a guest author and to do a, a, a foreword, um, which was, um, I don't know if you're going to be able to see that, but anyway, we all begin somewhere, it says. Yep. So this, I'm not going to read it, don't worry, but um, the, this is a couple of pages of the story of how I, I got into writing, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of people kind of do the, you know, when, when writers are asked that question, they, they, more often than not, they'll say, well, you know, I, I, I wrote uh, cute stories about my teddies when I was six, and then when I was a teenager, I wrote a story about me playing for my favourite football team, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and they entered combat and I won a Young Writer of the Year competition in, yeah. you know, when I was 12 and this kind of stuff. Um, I did none of that at all. Uh, not even, I, in fact, I did the opposite of that. So anything that was, anything that involved having to write more than a sentence, I just steered clear of completely. So when I was, I don't know if it's still the same now in the UK, when I, when I was um, of an age back in the day, I think I was 14 or something, and you get the choice between, taking history for GCSE or taking art for GCSE. And I, I can't draw, <laughs> I, like, if, if, I, if I did a stick man, it, it wouldn't look like a stick man. Do you know, like, I, I just can't draw a stick man. <laughs> so I picked art because um, history involved lots of writing. So I was like, well, I'm not doing that. So I'll go and do art, you know. Exactly so, the same, yeah. Yeah, so, um, and, and now I've written three historical novels, so go figure. But, He's gone. He died. Oh no! <laughs> I'll try to bring him back. Hang on. Hold on. Hold on. He's back. Hello? <laughs> he just vanished. He just what happened there? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, That's just... <laughs> <laughs> I pressed my I've, mute I've button. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I, literally, I pressed the mute button because the kid was making some noise. Just I pressed the mute button, you disappeared. I was like, ah! <laughs> I don't know your fault. There. It's your fault. Yeah, yeah, I'll take the my mute button. Um, killed you off, don't worry. Um, continue. 
<laughs> this is going to blow people's yeah. amazing. I love it. <laughs> Where were we? Um, you were talking about uh, art during. So, sticks, um, what was the same? So, do... yep, that's all that. Stick. <laughs> That's right. Doing... Who, who doesn't yeah. talk to an author and talk about drawing stick mate? Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so anyway, so, so I, I I stay clear of, the, of anything to do with writing. So I dropped history GCSE and and that was that. And then um, like the only thing that, what I put in that forward there is when I was, I went to work for um, a, an insurance company in Liverpool and in like a big call center, and people would. Um, actually, it's kind of at the start of email, which is kind of how long ago it was. And uh, I know I don't look more than 21, but, you know. Um, and people would ask me to to kind of write a letter of complaint to some company that, you know, they'd been, you know, let down by or whatever, had some poor service. And they'd ask me to, to just kind of word it for them. And I used to love just trying to pick the right word so that it was kind of ambiguous enough when it needed to be and it was forthright enough and, and and they couldn't wriggle out of it if I'd picked a certain word and all this kind of thing. I used to love just messing about with the words and just making it watertight for them and sending it off. So you and, like um, destroying and that, the people. That, that was that and, and people used to say, you know, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. And uh, and I would, like people would say, look, people always say this to, to people like me, you know, and, and they would say, oh, you should write a book, you know, and it's, you know, so much so. It's a cliche, isn't it? You know, oh, you should write a book. So I used to go, oh, yeah, 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 I should, yeah. Um, and then never never did anything about it. And then I got to 40. I turned 40 uh, in 2017. And, and now I, I, it, it wasn't like a midlife crisis, like, oh, my God, I'm 40. I have to achieve something. But it was just, just coincidence. But anyway, I got to the age of 40. And uh, for whatever reason, I thought, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just start and, and see what happens. So... I kind of potted around and came up with the idea of making man. And I remember writing the, the first line, which um, I won't try and find out, but the first line is that I wrote anyway, not the first line of the book is um, the, the sun rose like an almost too heavy balloon. And I thought, well, that's quite good. You know, that's, that's you know, that's a, a nice line with a little bit of comedy in it. And yeah, that's fine. I'll do, I'll just do another line. Do you know, and I just, um, Another line. It turns out actually that that line about the balloon um, is inadvertently almost entirely plagiarised from Terry Pratchett, but I didn't I didn't realise that at the time. But anyway, um, so and, and then I just I just did another sentence, then did him sitting on the rocky outcrop as I said earlier, and, and named the places, and then came up with the try. And it just and I just I didn't stop enjoying it. I think that's what it was. So I just kept adding adding lines here and there, and just potted around. Didn't really think. Never, I don't. I probably didn't really think that it was actually going to end up being a book. I thought it would be a little pet project for a couple of weeks, and then it would get saved on the computer and never to be seen again. But I just kept going, and I, and I just, I just enjoyed it so much, and it was so much fun. And and then when I got to the, when I got to a point where I thought, hang on, I've, this is nearly finished. This story is nearly actually all tied up in a nice, neat bow. Do you know? Like I thought, oh, this is. This is great. So, so anyway, I, I looked into self-publishing initially. Um, I queried, obviously, and sent it around to places, and then came up with this. Found a guy to do the the cover art. Read the blurb back, and and then he. I, I still don't know how you you format things for Amazon because I got somebody else to do it for me. But it just all then turned up as a as a book one day in the post, and I thought. That's all it took. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like, I got sorry, the, the, the writing bit was the writing bit was yeah. But like the writing bit was was like was tangible and I, and I knew what I was doing and it was okay. There's a lot a lot of work, but it wasn't hard work. It was enjoyable work, you know. But then you know I, I kind of kind of waved a wand at someone else and this just appeared, you know. And I thought that's that's great, you know. It's amazing. So I did the same with Cheating Death and then Three Ravens Publishing. Uh, Three Ravens Publishing picked up the two of these um, while I was writing Killing Chance. So they then uh, took Killing Chance on and. I'm now uh, on my case to get the sci-fi finished because that's I think that's the one that they were they really really want is the the sci-fi comedy. So um, so that's that's how I got into it. I mean, it was it's it's not that it was by accident, but it, it it wasn't it wasn't kind of a conscious decision at the age of forty to say, okay, I'm now going to go and write a book. I'm now going to be a writer. I just kind of I need to write that book. Messing about really, just chucking a few lines together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Damn, they were right. 
Um, <laughs> so, yeah, and it, and it just, you know, it was, it was just, and it's, it kind of sounds like I'm oversimplifying it, but it, but that's just what I just, you know, put another line after that line and kept going. And I think the important thing was that I kept enjoying it. And and when I read it back, when I was doing editing and so on after the, the first the, the first draft was done, I read it back and, and thought, you know, and not not in in a an immodest way, but I just thought it's, a, it's actually quite good. Do you know, like that's that's turned into a good story with with good humor. You know, there's a bit of equality in there. There's a, there's all kinds of different topics there that I covered, and um and I thought God, that 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 actually works. That's actually you know, it's it's a competent piece of literature. Do you know, so so I have to try this again, and then and then Cheat and Death came and Killing Chance came. So, um, but I, I just haven't stopped enjoying it. So I think you know I would do it. It's something I would do. I mean, I'm a, I'm a full time writer now, but I would do it even if that wasn't my, my full time job. I would I would keep writing because it's it's such fun to write, particularly comedy, like because you you just end up chuckling to yourself as you're writing it, and you think of the, the funny comebacks and the the funny characters who, you know, do things that that you wouldn't do yourself, and it's just, it's just great crack just writing it, you know. So, and if people read it and enjoy it, all the better. Um, and people seem to, but um, it, that's just a bit of a bonus, really. So, um, it's just great fun, and also it's a great feeling to have the three, you know, that I can say, well, there's, you know, there's my bibliography there, and it's done, you know. Um, so if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, at least I'll have achieved something. <laughs> well, you're always part of history now. With your free so books, that's... you're part of history. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I shouldn't have dropped history either. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All you, right, have, then. you haven't got a lemon, have you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, actually, I've got a couple. I'll have to just sort of throw them through the screen for you. Uh, right, Okay. Anything else you wish to talk about? We have covered the list. Is there anything you wish to elaborate on before we um, wrap this up? I don't think so. I think the only thing is if if somebody stumbles across this video and thinks, you know, uh, they say they haven't they haven't written a book, they're not sure if they can. Just like, and I know this isn't supposed to be a big motivational video for aspiring writers necessarily, but but just just start writing. Like you just. The, the way you write a book is to start by writing one line. And that's literally what I did. And I, and I, I wrote one line, took me, you know, I looked at it for about five minutes afterwards. And, uh, and, and that's all it takes. It's, it's the hardest bit is writing the first word and the first line. And once you've done that, the rest just follows. Like you don't need a big, well, depending on your personality, I suppose, you don't need big 20 page outlines. Like I read someone online who'd written a hundred thousand word outline of a, sci-fi epic that they were going to be writing and i thought god i could make that into that could be two books done do you know <laughs> like like you you don't need to do that unless you want to you don't need to do that you just and you don't even need a fully formed idea like making man i didn't have a notion what it was going to be about when i started writing it and that's part of the fun is that you you write and you can always go back and change you know, tweak things um when you finish to go back and let, make the rest of it make sense but part of the fun is if you're writing it not knowing what's happening or what sorry what's going to happen then that's how the reader's reading it so you you know it's you're then able to put the surprises in wherever you want you otherwise if you know what the surprise is going to be you'll probably inadvertently give the game away earlier on in the in the story because you know that you know so and so is about to you know jump off a cliff or whatever he's going to do you know so if you don't know then you're not going to give it away and so any surprise you put in really will be a surprise you know so it's it's. I think it's often overcomplicated how to write a book, and sometimes you just need to start writing it and see what happens. You know, that would be my my take on it. For what, what a little amateur philosopher over here, but that that would be. No, that that's would be my right. Take on like, it. It, um, you're not the only one who says. But that. if you want to get just, get in touch with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no we're, sorry. Do, we're doing contact. Now. There's, there's a bit of. A, he's on his phone, so there's a bit of a, a time lag between the phone and. My computer. That's why it's doing this for people to understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Cool. All right. Well. Um, so will I do contacts well, then? Yes. Go on and do your contacts. We will put this in the description, but he's going to say it, and then he's going <laughs> to send me over his contract contacts as well. Um, so go do your contacts, and then yeah. send, send the contract. What, what contract? Oh, no, I contract, send contract. Um, Pen. 
Okay, so you can get me on Twitter at John Drake Writer. It's gone very laggy now. Here we go. But anyway, I'll, I'll just I'll steam on anyway, right? So um, you can get me on Twitter at John Drake Writer. You can get me on Facebook at Author John Drake. Uh, not to be mistaken with the other John Drake who does uh, pirate uh, swashbuckling adventures. Um, and if you feel the need to email me, you can do it, johndrakewriter at gmail.com. Um, and you can get all of my books on Amazon or through the Three Ravens publishing website. Um, and keep your eyes open for Zoomers coming early 2021. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you very much. Good. Hope everyone enjoyed the video. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to say, yeah, that's it. That's my whole goodbye. And I'm going to exit now. That's it. And then I always edit stuff because sometimes when I'm doing a video, like a kid walks in or a kid walks in on your side because I was doing a few with someone else and like the kid just sort of walked in and the guy's like, I'm doing a video. Go, oh, go. Oh. <laughs> and I, I had one. It was late at night. I was doing uh, Chris Kennedy. And um, was doing a video, and then my, my son just walked in. He's like, open door was like, Dad. And I'm like, one minute, I'll be back in a minute. I had to run off, and then he, I his legs were hurting. So I had to go wake my partner up. Just, she's asleep. So she's then angry because I've woken her up. But I'm like, I'm in the middle of an interview. I kind of need to go back doing the interview. You know what I'm saying? It's just, yeah, it's just complete chaos. Hello, the greatest living Irish. Say again. So, what you sorry. Sorry, go on now. I'm just looking at you. Go on, go on. No, it's all right. I'll cut it all out. It's fine. You just ruined me intro. It's all right. I know it's a blooper. That's what I do. This happens. I have bloopers at the end of the video. So you're a blooper now. You've done it. Um, right, let's do it. Um, I can't know what I was going to say now. Damn it. Um, that's it. Oh, drop the pen. Um, hello, I'm from the channel. Usually one by one. My name is Joe, and today we have another.